So after quantum physics has just been dismissed, we're trying to actually make a, a point about quantum physics. Um, we are operating based on the principle of putting forth theory, making predictions, and having experiments to prove or disprove the theory. Um, I'd like to see more of those critical experiments, especially I'm, I had this discussion with uh, Francois at his last talk, what kind of experiment could be uh, either put forth to, to disprove or, di or, or prove this theory. So coming back to this, um, um, we, uh, I worked with Peter Hegelstein at, at MIT and um, uh, last year at the conferences in Xiamen and uh, Sendai we put forth an experiment which can so, uh, serve as a critical experiment um, of sort for, for Peter's theory of uh, phononuclear coupling and up and down conversion. And um, originally this talk was meant uh, as a, uh, a leisurely talk going through the updates on uh, the experiment on our equipment, showing some preliminary data, which uh, was initially negative but it's really part of a larger experimental campaign um, which, which uh, is supposed to cover a wide parameter space. That was the original plan and then last week um, Mother Nature decided to tease us with uh, a signal, an unexpected signal that we're now pretty confident is an anomaly so we decided to spontaneously rearrange our talk a little bit and I'm gonna uh, somewhat rush through the initial section giving you a quick update. Um, and then we'll ha have the second, the larger part of the second part of the talk um, focused on discussing the anomaly and, and attempting some interpretations. Uh, again, I like to refer to last year's talks um, for more details in terms of the motivation and the theoretical motivation and uh, some more of the, the details on the equipment. And also, please just come to me and, uh, and we can chat after the talk if you want to know more about. Uh, about this. I do have a quick motivation slide just sort of to connect this work to um, the, the field at large. So the, the initial conjecture was, the, the initial question was, that Peter started out with, was what happens to the 24 MeV um, that uh, relate to the mass defect from the DD to the uh, helium-4 reaction. Uh, why do we not observe this 24 MeV in the form of energetic radiation? And Peter's conjecture is that um, what we're looking at is a, a down conversion mechanism where this large quantum of energy can be down converted into a large number of small quanta, like we're talking tens or hundreds of millions of small quanta of energy. And uh, an implication of, of uh, this approach would be that the reverse process would, must be possible as well, that you can uh, in fact up convert a large number of small energy quanta and uh, you can uh, therefore achieve, uh, uh, you can uh, end up with a large uh, quantum that can excite a, a, nuclear, a nucleus to an excited state, which then can fall back and emit a, a phonon uh, in the process. So this is the theoretical motivation, and it's supported by um, a bunch of uh, uh, experimental observations, which I refer to here based on the Carbot, the Kornilova and Vizotsky experiments, and also uh, some experiments here in Italy um, by uh, Carpentieri and Cardone, which all, which all have the common denominator that um, uh, radiation was observed in connection with uh, mechanical vibrations, mechanical excitation. Uh, so I'm gonna move right on to our basic experimental setup. Um, so we ha we're looking at a steel plate with a piezoelectric transducer on it. Um, and so basically both of our experiments have the same structure. We're looking at inducing vibrations and then we have different types of detectors to, to pick up radiation uh, as, a, as a consequence. Um, so we have the steel plate, we, we vibrate it, um, we have some uh, wooden blocks here to provide some damping. Um, and Peter can later motivate theoretically why the damping is important. And, uh, and then we have here in this uh, uh, variation of the experiment a Geiger counter and uh, a photomultiplier based uh, X-ray spectrometer where we focus really on the 1 to 20 kV range. And so the idea is then as we switch on the vibrations, um, the expectation or the prediction would be that we would expect uh, low energy X-rays um, to, to emit uh, from the plate. 
And so I'm going to just go into a little bit more detail for s different components. So the, the ultrasound system, the, um, uh, you can see here uh, in the photograph, so we have a, a broadband ultra ultrasound tra uh, transducer here that we use for making uh, wide uh, uh, scans across a wide range of frequencies. So that would be a scan from, say, 1 megahertz to 3 megahertz um, to then see the, um, to measure the vibrational response of the plate in various ways, optically or also based on uh, the power spectrum that the, uh, the tr transducer produces. And then we have also, uh, instead of the, besides the broadband transducers, we have these high power uh, transducers which are relatively narrow band. And so here you can see uh, a scan where we go, this is the frequency here. Um, we, so we're linearly going up uh, a band and then here the yellow line would be the power response and you can see different resonances. Uh, so here we would have a plate resonance. This is with this transducer. We would have a plate resonance and we would have a transducer resonance. And then to maximize the vibrations, the amplitude, we would want to have a, an overlap of, of those two resonances. And you can see some of the temperature data here. Um, Coming back to the experimental setup, now looking at the detectors, so we, we built this uh, very sensitive but relatively low resolution um, photomultiplier based X-ray spectrometer. And so it's uh, got a three inch diameter, it's got a, a rad film window which is basically an aluminum coated uh, mylar foil and uh, you can see here that's some actual data of a cobalt 57 source. Um, uh, this is about 20 seconds worth of data. We got about uh, 1,500 uh, counts per second with this uh, 200 microcurie cobalt source. Uh, and, um, and then we, we take these spectra and every minute we store them and we break them up into different channels so we get some time dependence. So here you can see over a few hours, you can see the stability of the different channels. So this is the 2 to, to 4, 4 to 10 kV channel. Um, being stable as expected, but then, of course, in our experiments, we expect something to happen here as we switch on the vibrations. Uh, the last components in this uh, experiment, the last component is the Geiger counter, which is a Ludlum Geiger counter up here, and uh, you can see some background here, about 150 to 170 counts per minute with the uh, Geiger counter as a background. So that's the actual um, experiment. Um, so you see the transducer here, Geiger counter, photomultiplier detector, and the damping blocks. And um, just a few more slides on the damping. So we, we uh, went through some effort to characterize the damping and move in the blocks and sort of try to study how uh, higher degrees of damping uh, would distort the resonances. So as we, so these are just three different configurations, little damping, medium damping, and much damping. And you can see the actual uh, power uh, spectra here. So here is the frequency from 1.95 megahertz to 2.25 megahertz. Uh, this is the uh, piezo, uh, the transducer resonance, and this is the, the uh, plate resonance. And so this is it. We can expect this to remain the same and the, and the plate resonance to change. So you can see this is the little damping. We're just uh, damping a little bit on the corner. And then as we move the blocks farther in, you can see the plate resonance to, to widen um, and, and become distorted. And so here, we, this is the maximum degree of damping. So we, we, achieve our, we achieve the damping. We can put some power into the... Um, into the plates here, you can see in yellow again the power uh, on the on this axis. So we put up to 150 watts here into the uh, transducers for these scans, and so so we're happy with the mechanical part of the system. And um, this is on the same um, time axis, so you can see the correlation between what we're doing mechanically with the vibrations up here. So we have three different scans here, and down here you can see the. Uh, channels of the X-ray detector um, where we expect to see a response. And so initially we were curious about these kind of peaks here because that's the kind of thing we're expecting. So we expect to do something mechanically and we expect to see some response from the radiation detectors. But upon a closer look, we, we found out that uh, this is the reactor, uh, the, the, re uh, the detector reacting to the mechanical vibration. So we get these these pulses, which are very uncharacteristic, uh, we call them false, false pulses. Um, and um, 
here is a comparison with, the, with an actual pulse from the fo photomultiplier detector that's, that's caused by pho photons. So, um, so that's just uh, one of the challenges that we sort of started to encounter once we operated this, the system and uh, our response was to uh, increase the, the insulation of the detector from the mechanical components um, and also filter out some of the false pulses, operate a lower power. So we have some ideas on how to respond to this. Another challenge is that with this rad film detector, again, which is aluminum based, we have um, uh, relatively poor uh, transmission in this 1.5 kV region, which we're, we're particularly interested in. So uh, the response would be to move to a beryllium window, which you can see here, this is from 1,000 to 5,000 kV, it has a much better transition, uh, transmission here uh, in the 1.5 kV range. So that's also something we're working on. And then lastly, uh, another reason why we haven't observed so far the 1.5 kV emission could be that uh, we're not having enough mercury in our system. So the idea which we talk more about in Japan was that um, mercury has a, a very low uh, excited, the lowest excited nuclear state for mercury is at 1.5 kV and that's what we're shooting for, that would be the lowest hanging fruit for us to show this effect. Um, but we need to have enough mercury in our system and the uh, conjecture is that in the other experiments, uh, particularly in Russia, that observed the 1.5 kV emission, there was some uh, significant degree of mercury contamination on their plates. And so we don't know whether we have that same level of mercury contamination. So the easiest thing to do would be to cause that com contamination ourselves. And uh, we learned how to make these uh, mercury amalgams. And so that's also on our, on our to-do list to uh, apply copious amounts of mercury to the, surf to the surface and see wh whether it makes a difference. So that was, that's the status quo of our upconversion experiment. And then we have an extension to that experiment, which is in which we don't try to um, create or in induce uh, nuclear excitation from scratch, but we are actually we, we're dealing with some nuclear excitation um, which is present already, so here in, this, in the form of a cobalt-57 source, and we're trying to transfer that excitation to other nuclei. Um, so the idea here would be we're transferring it uh, through the, the nuclear phonon coupling. So it's the phonons, we depend on the phonons to uh, achieve that transfer. So the idea here is again, we have a, a, a very conventional setup here where we're looking at uh, a cobalt-57 source and then we switch on the vibrations, we introduce some phonons into the system and we, ex we expect to see some, or we, we, we hope to see some transfer of that um, excitation of these, uh, some of these excited nuclei to other nuclei, to iron nuclei uh, in that plate. And so we would expect to see some radiation uh, emitted from other parts of the plate and um, at the same time we would expect to see the uh, uh, radiation of the cobalt-57 source to go down. Um, so there's a, a bunch of um, ways in which we could detect such an effect if it occurs. So here we have an, another detector uh, introduced which is an Amtec X123 uh, X-ray spectrometer which differs from our photomultiplier spectrometer in that it has a much higher resolution but it's also less sensitive. Um, so um, here you can see the the cobalt-57 source that we uh, evaporated onto the steel plate and then sealed with epoxy and here's just a, uh, a picture, a radiograph of it. Um, we, now we operate with a different steel plate, it's normally the same thickness but I showed you just this graph to, 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 to give you a sense of how whenever you have a different plate your resonance is going to be slightly different even if it's normally the same. So with this original plate for the upconversion experiment the plate resonance was slightly below the transducer resonance and working with the same transducer for this plate the resonance is, is slightly higher. Um, just a, a slide on the X123 detector, so that's what it looks like. Here's a, an actual spectrum that we took of the cobalt-57 source, so you can see the K-alpha and K-beta lines, and you can see also the very nice high resolution, very clear um, spectrum, and we do the same thing as with the other detector. We um, store the spectrum every minute, and then uh, we, we, we take out the channel so we get some time resolution. That's the uh, setup for the excitation transfer experiment. 
Um, and you can see the X123 down here um, uh, looking at the cobalt 57 source at the bottom of the steel plate. So that's some preliminary data where we drive. Um, we have uh, three different on-off cycles where we drive the uh, transducer at uh, about 20 watts. And uh, here are the highest uh, amp tech channels. And so uh, our prediction would have been to see a dip in these um, uh, during the time when we induce the vibrations. But, but we, we can't see that here, so we'll have to do more experiments um, and maybe drive at higher power and have some other uh, variations of the experiment to see that. But now I'm coming to uh, the anomalous observation that we ran into, and that is, if you note, this is a relatively uh, brief period of time, so we're looking at one day here, uh, whereas here we're looking at about uh, more than a week of data. And so when we initially put the plate in and put the AmpTech in place, which is right here, we noticed a decline of the, uh, of the AmpTech channels. And uh, just to remind you, these, are, these channels here represent, uh, you know, uh, one sample every minute of the, of the, the uh, cobalt peaks in the, in the AmpTech here. And so, so that's unusual, so we wouldn't expect these uh, peaks to change, and it, certainly not at this, uh, well, we would expect them to change in, in accordance with the, the, the decay rate, but not, uh, but not uh, at that kind of speed where we see a 20% decline within uh, a couple of days. And um, so that's kind of, that sums up where we're at, and so Peter is going to talk a little bit more about, about the data and uh, analyze it a little bit more. Handing over to him. Okay, so um, let me go through the channels. What I've done is I've smoothed the data to reduce the uh, uncertainty so we can see the trends a little bit better. Uh, I also, in this case, I took the full range of a million uh, seconds, which I think is eight and a half days, something like that. Uh, this is the lowest channel from zero to six keV. Uh, in this one, largely, we don't see very much. Um, this one has the uh, K-alpha, the iron K-alpha, and it's clearly showing a non-exponential decay that lasts a couple of days. Um, this is the K-beta. It basically shows the same thing. This is the channel between uh, 8 kV and 14 kV, so it's an intermediate channel. So it's showing basically the normal half-life. Uh, here's the 14.4 kV nuclear transition. It's showing the same uh, anomaly. Uh, here's the here's a plot. The upper ones, the iron K alpha. The lower ones, the 14.4 kV. And you can see that they're sort of sort of similar in terms of their the magnitude of the effect and the uh, dynamics. Um, here's the high uh, energy channel above uh, 15 keV. Uh, at some point, the uh, X123 runs out of uh, sensitivity, probably around 25 or 30 keV. Um, so I'm thinking, the X123 data is showing a clear anomaly. We're getting the faster than exponential decay for k alpha, k beta, and the 14.4 kV transition. Um, late in time, we get exponential decay with the expected half-life. Uh, we're basically seeing expected half-life in the intermediate channels. A little bit of a deviation from exponential decay in 15 to 25, um, and so forth. So an enhancement of k alpha, k beta at 14.4 at early time. Um, let me show also the Geiger counter data, which is interesting. So the X123 is looking at the front side or the bottom, which is looking directly at the cobalt 57 uh, and epoxy. The Geiger counter is on the top, so it's looking at the back side. The steel is three millimeters thick. 14.4 kV in the K-alpha, K-beta cannot make it through three millimeters of uh, steel. And so on the back side, we're seeing um, uh, an anomaly. In the middle, there's some data loss. There's data loss in the other uh, data as well. Um, so I'm trying to think, uh, how can we explain this? So I've had uh, a number of explanations. Uh, the data taking ended on uh, June 1st. So I've had all kinds of time to, at my leisure, think about what the data means and what, how to interpret it. The, the very first interpretation was perhaps we were losing uh, cobalt 57, 
which would mean if we could d destroy uh, radioactive material, there's a lot of applications for that, that'd be very good. The only thing is, is if I look at the intermediate channel like this, the, uh, this is due primarily to um, basically the 122 kV line. Um, if I look at the higher channel, for example, this is due primarily to the 122 kV line, and it's decaying sort of normally exponentially. So that tells me I'm not losing uh, cobalt 57. Uh, but on the other hand, why, are, why is the 14.4 getting to be brighter? Um, so I came up with all kinds of explanations for that, and more or less as soon as I came up with them, I discarded them. And then ultimately I, I came up with a, another picture which I have high hopes for, which I want to share with you. But in order to share it with you, I'm going to go back a little bit to the uh, Fleisch and Pons experiment. So for Fleisch and Pons experiment, if you have a DD reaction, you'd expect energetic nuclei, but we don't see energetic nuclear radiation in Fleisch and Pons experiment commensurate with the energy. So the first thought was maybe uh, it could decay down by basically uh, down conversion, that the nuclear, large nuclear energy quanta could get split up into lots of quanta. That was my first theory. Of course, I calculated that out. I have a model to do this, and I can show very quickly that that doesn't work very well at all. The second version of it was an excitation transfer thing where I start out with excited uh, uh, D2, and then do excitation transfer to transfer it to some nucleus in the lattice, which would then subsequently, um, uh, you know, down convert the radiation. Now, this works much better in the model, but the headache is, is that there's no nucleus that's metastable up in 24 MeV. You wouldn't expect anything like that to occur. So I scratched my head. My model was telling me that there's another way to look at it, that if you have... Um, a D2 excited state, instead of excitation transfer to an excitation state 24 MeV, if you did the excitation, you basically did a subdivision, so you chopped the 24 MeV up into lots of 90 kilovolt quanta, then your excitation transfer would sort of do this. And um, so this is, I've given talks on this, and it's in my papers and stuff, but the subdivision business, um, uh, is what the models are most enthusiastic about for Fleischmann ponds. So, and then subsequently you, you could uh, down convert by phonons and the models are much happier with this. This kind of thing uh, can actually calculate out okay. Now what about for uh, cobalt 57 decay? So cobalt 57 decays and it feeds into an excited state at 136 keV. And normally um, and this is a simplified version of it, but the uh, iron-57 excited state decays giving off 122 keV photon, which we don't have a gamma we didn't have a gamma detector mounted in this, so we didn't monitor it, but in future experiments we could. We also get a 14.4 uh, keV photon from the decay from the lower state. So if you think about this, uh, this is, we could think of this as being analogous to the fi figure that we had before. And um, if we start with the excited state, and we have ground state nuclei iron 57 nearby, because we got a whole steel plate of iron, and 2.1% of it is uh, iron 57. If we have subdivision, then it's sort of excitation transfer to many uh, excited state uh, iron nuclei. Uh, in this particular case, there's four drawn in here, but the number would be closer to nine. Uh, and 9 times 14.4 keV gets you up to about 130 keV, so you're about 6 keV off. But if you can down convert 6 keV, then the subdivision should work just fine, at least according to the models. So if it worked this way, then you would expect to see um, for every 122 uh, keV photon that you lost, you would be gaining about 9, uh, 14 keV photons. So if we go back to the data, so I'm going to go back and back and back and back. So we see um, for the 14.4 kV data, 14.4 uh, kV transition, we get, I don't know, 15 or 20 percent here. If we divide 15 or 20 percent by uh, 9, we, we get something in the general neighborhood of a percent. And if you stare at this channel, and this channel I think is particularly interesting, 
uh, it's the high energy channel above the 14.4 K alpha, so we know that this is happening only because of 122 keV. Um, when I was staring at this, I was uh, struck by the fact that uh, it, it's also not quite exponential, but instead of being high at early times, it's actually low uh, at early times, and it's low by like a percent or something. Um, this, it wasn't obvious the first time that I plotted it up or even the second time, but then after staring at it for a while, uh, it seems that it's, there's a little bit of a droop uh, at early time. So I'm, when we go back, I'm going to analyze this thing to death and see if I can get uh, you know, any uh, degree of quantitative agreement. So let's go. So if this is true, the excitation transfer would have to be by optical phonons. The question is, where does the optical phonons come from? So the idea is that our experiment was a horrible failure in the sense that the system is not responding to the 2 megahertz radiation even if we drive it at 100 watts or something. On the other hand, when we bolted down the wooden clamps on one side or the other, it stressed the material. And as you can imagine, if you just tighten things up, uh, the wood's going to relax over a couple of days, the steel's going to relax, and I basically I think we've got a high-frequency phonon generator that we've got next to it. And so I think that's what's producing the uh, vibrations here, not our um, megahertz uh, ultrasonic uh, uh, generators. So this would have to be, this effect would be a front side effect. So the the increase here would have, because the steel abs is strongly absorbing, the subdivision and excitation transfer would have to be uh, very close to the surface um, in order to come through looking like this. But then we get to the Geiger counter data, and the Geiger counter data is showing an enhancement at early times, which cannot possibly be this effect, at least by the way I understand it. And the thing I'm thinking about for that early time stuff is that Perhaps the way it works is that early time, maybe we have a bigger, uh, you know, more either optical phonon or high frequency phonons. So maybe the amount of energy we can down convert or up convert is larger. So maybe at early times, uh, we can up convert perhaps as much as 14 kV or maybe enough to get the uh, K alpha and K beta to show up. So on the back side, I think this signal uh, at early time is actually due to an up conversion. Uh, effect. So I, th I, th I think we're actually seeing two different effects, one on the front side and one on the back side, they're, but they're both uh, intimately related to one another. So I, I think I'm going to stop here and uh, entertain questions. Okay, thank you. Of these levels. So the 14.4 kV. Uh, no, no, the large time. Right, the 14.4 kV uh, state has a lifetime of 81 nanoseconds, as I recall. Uh, half a second. And the 136 uh, kV line has a much shorter lifetime, and I, and I don't recall it, but it's some number, I think it's some number of picoseconds. So, so you, can, you, you could probably, by a phenomenon which I don't be handled yet, build the excitation to a level that you uh, decrease the uh, <coughs> lifetime of the, uh, the decay, you decrease the decay, in fact. I'm, I'm not understanding what you're asking. No, no, but the hypothesis I put forward that maybe something accumulates and gives a stable, a more stable uh, state, exit, uh, and yeah. a more stable excited state. Uh, okay, so, so if it were more it stable, would, it could be more stable because you could maybe have some magical way to remove uh, internal conversion and increase the yield. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any way in the laws of physics to make that happen. Um, yeah, but it, it's something, but to, it it's it's something to think true. about. <laughs> I, I, I think the subdivision is a much more straightforward explanation okay. and, and it's consistent with my models. So. Okay. Did you make some after experiment measurements? Does the level go up again after the, if you stop? Or, and what is the time function if you measure for maybe two or more, three more days? Will it 
No, no. The, go back to the old the, level? The, the downward sloping is due to the half-life of cobalt-57. Yeah. yeah. So it, 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 it's not going to come up again okay. unless you move it. It will speed up. Just yeah. Just going at the yeah. expected decay rate for another couple of days. Yeah. No, we didn't expect to see anything surprising anymore. Yeah. No long time measurement, but it so looks keep, like the normal decay rate now. Keep, keep, yeah, keep in mind this is yeah. um, one observation. Uh, yeah. Our job is to see it again and again if we possibly can, and maybe tame it and control it because it's, it's very interesting. So, your marine ply that you were using for damping uh, oscillations, one, uh, your transducer was 4 megahertz, am I right in saying that? 2.25 no, megahertz transducer. The high frequency, have you defined whether that's lower or higher than the 2.2? Oh, I'm thinking that the high frequency that's being generated are probably terahertz or 100 gigahertz or okay. something. Very high frequency, I think, is responsible for this. Okay. Uh, have you thought about how to detect for that? Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I've thought a lot. For example, um, it's conceivable, but it's a long shot, that we might be able to investigate terahertz in this kind of configuration with the Raman-type experiment. Um, to, to get at the gigahertz, a transducer could pick up gigahertz, but we don't have the uh, expertise, the gear, or the money, or the resources to implement that. But I know people who are experts in that who could help. Uh, uh, so my, my follow-on question is, uh, have you turned the thumb screws again and seen if the cycle repeats? Or is that just because this is so fresh data? Um, so... You like re-tightened the damping screws? Okay, so um, right now a ex uh, subsequent experiment is running where we uh, re-tighten okay. things. Yeah. And this is serving as a control experiment now. It's, it's yeah. going down beautifully. There's no bumps. There's no yeah. anything. It's a little bit like uh, with my, in my family, I, I tell jokes and my wife laughs. Now, what I'd like to do in the future is to synchronize things so my wife laughs when I tell my jokes. <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't gotten to that. But, but uh, do, do you think it could be the structure of the marine, marine ply breaking down once, and then when you re, re, redo it, like using fresh marine ply? Um, that, that's a good question to which I, I don't know the answer. At the okay. moment, we're, we're going to continue working with the wood we've got okay. and compress. And if we have no joy, then it's we'll... Not a fresh bit of wood. Well, that and more, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, Peter, I have a question for you. Uh, first of all, uh, I like very much this experiment because uh, this is a systematic attempt to isolate uh, coherent phenomena. Uh, the nature. mechanism to understand what's going on microscopically. Yes, so I, I like it very much. Uh, by the way, uh, I think that uh, uh, coherent phenomena are a key factor for explaining LENR. So uh, doing this experience will give insight in this kind of, uh, so, so this is very good. By the way, this is um, very similar to what uh, Preparata, Giuliano Preparata theory is, uh, is about. But I have a suggestion for you that may be interesting. Uh, now you are trying to up-convert phonon energy up to KV, KV right? So it, this is a ra rather difficult uh, task because you have many you, you need to have many phonons, right? Yes, you, you, you do it. But another thing you may try is to, for example, consider uh, fluorescence yeah. with, uh, with a stimulated emission. This would be with a smaller energy, so maybe it would be easier. And you could see a variation in, in the decay constant of uh, fluorescence and uh, things like so that. So the, the, the models um, which I've been pursuing, and I'll talk some more about uh, tomorrow, the basic coupling is between vibrations and internal nuclear degrees of freedom. Uh, the coupling to atomic uh, yes, is in this case that would be not nuclear, sure, for sure. So but we have to be coupling between the nuclear. So you are really interested in in the nucleus, but 
it may be a, a side, a side yeah. e experiment yeah. to, to run. I agree. OK. Any questions? Peter, uh, maybe it's a, it's a crazy question. OK? Sorry. No, no, no. Um, maybe one, one way simple to have a cross-check is to make some um, coating, some device, and uh, coating, coating. The, the layer, sorry. And uh, by infrared lamp, you can get easily up to one kilowatt. And uh, maybe more easy to check the correlation. What do you think? Um, infrared, infrared lamp, so you have a, a terrace region easily. Well, I'll have to talk to you more about it. Um, if we can get this kind of thing to work, um, the cobalt-57 is in an epoxy on top of the steel. And according to the interpretation here, the excitation transfer is to the steel underneath it. But suppose we mix some mercury with the cobalt-57. Perhaps we could transfer the excitation to upconvert or or uh, subdivision to the 1.5 keV transition, and perhaps it would be an easier experiment. So I have a very large number of uh, variants of this in mind, that if we can master this technology, we would have a large number of experiments to demonstrate an ability to yes. vibrate and okay. control nuclei. I th I'm thinking about mercury. You can make very, very thin, because amalgam, you can make very right. thin surface. Right, right. Maybe more easy, I don't know. More easy uh, to, to detect. <laughs> thank you. No questions? Okay. I'm not sure to have understood everything, but between the ground state and the excited state, you have several sub level you want to go from up uh, step by step. Um, there's, there's only three states uh, at low energy in IN57. There's a, there's a ground state, there's a 14.4, there's a 136, and then there's higher energy. There, there are not okay, intermediate the next, nuclear states. In the next... Uh, yes. But if you want to go up from uh, the ground state to this excited state, you have several steps indeed, huh? each time. Uh, right, so again, I, I have a model for how to do that without conversion of vibrations yeah, yeah. of basically terahertz phonons up to KEV uh, level. So you have several sub-levels uh, to go for. Uh, to go. It, 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 yeah, coherent mechanism. Yeah, so yeah. Well, so no, that's a coherent the, mechanism. There's a bit of a risk. No, there, there's no resonance sub-levels. It's, it's going off on a long journey off resonance to hook up at the end. But that, that's basically what the models do. Yeah, it's, it's exactly right. <laughs>